welcome to this review of my Mountain Everest Max keyboard. I requested this keyboard well over a year ago. Unfortunately, its development incurred serious delays because of the COVID crisis, but I got it in recently and I've been toying around with it for a while. I asked for it because it's got a lot of interesting features attached to it, quite literally in this case, but we'll get to that one in a bit. They also have a version without the extra stuff called the Everest Core and even one without any switches, so just the chassis called the Core Bare Bones. It's very similar to the GMMK in that regard. Like the GMMK, it's a hot swappable keyboard and like the new GMMK Pro, it's aimed at doing a bit more than just being a hot swappable chassis, of which there are quite a few now. Which is a good thing because hot swappability is quite useful in my opinion. The chassis is made out of CNC'd aluminium, or in flat earth units, aluminum. Interestingly, it has two plates in it rather than one, and sandwiched between them is a light ribbon. Although I haven't done any destructive testing with it, I imagine this adds noticeably to its structural integrity. It's still a fairly light keyboard though, the rest is just plastic so the TKL part only weighs 1 pound and 15 and 22,470, 54,672 of an ounce, or in real units 880 grams. See how fast that was? Remember, switching to metric is always faster than using imperial. Anyway, I think it's actually a really nice looking keyboard. The key area slightly sunken into the plate, not enough to give it any real protection, so it's still kind of a floating switch design, but it looks a lot better than just a flat plate. Plus, I like the cleanliness of the design and the gray color and the metal. However, the CNC markings are pretty rough. They definitely could have done with getting polished off. It comes in this giant box that looks like a chest of drawers, the top of which holds the keyboard and the wrist rest, and the bottom holds the extra modules, plus the cable and a switch puller. The cable's fairly monstrous, by the way. It's very thick and it's braided, but it's not very pliable, so it can get in the way a bit. Thankfully, there's a cable gutter for it on the bottom, as well as thinner gutters for headphone cables, for example. That's actually pretty useful. I tried it out in my office in the lab, and it made everything a lot more accessible. Anyway, onto the modules. There's two main ones, this numpad and this media thing. Both can be mounted on one of two hard points on the top and side, or used detached via a small USB-C cable included in the box. The media thing has these five buttons, the micro switches unfortunately, not real key switches, with media shortcuts like forward, backward, play, slash, pause, I mark that one with some red tape because it's the only one I ever use, and mute. There's also a wheel on it, a rather big one actually, with a built-in OLED screen. It can be used for several functions, which you can highlight with the wheel and then select with this button. You can use it for functions like brightness, volume, and also for displaying things like CPU stats, a clock, and whatnot. It's also customizable. However, I found it to be not without its flaws. I always use it for volume, I really don't see much use for the other functions, so I disabled the other functions in the controlling software. However, when I turn the wheel, I still need to select volume first before I can adjust the volume, even if it's the only option that I can select, which is really unnecessary and it makes absolutely no sense to me. Also, there's about a three quarter second delay before it starts to register any input anyway, which again seems completely unnecessary. I've never seen that on a volume wheel before actually. However, the wheel is nice and big and easy to grab onto, which is nice. It's not super smooth, but whatever. Some other wheels, like this Razor one, are so fucking tiny and thin that it's not so easy to control. Also, that one's pretty flimsy. This one feels fairly solid. Another disadvantage I found is that without the controlling software installed, it worked quite poorly. The volume level shown on the dial never matched the system volume, and even if I zeroed them both, they would immediately diverge again afterwards. Plus, the pause play button only worked if you were in the window you tried to pause for some reason, which kind of defeats the purpose. I mean, both are fixed now that I've installed the software, but still... <laughs> Speaking of the software, it's called Basecamp, and although it's not difficult to use, it is fairly big at 300 megabytes, and it loads every single byte of that into your RAM when in use. Even when it's not in use, it keeps it running, at a more modest 20 megabytes, but still, not cool, man. I'm not a fan of software that you shouldn't really need in the first place, let alone running silently in the background if you actively try to close it down. I don't know what it is with controlling software sneakily remaining active. Is this the 
DRM of Keyboard World or something, or rather really that desperate for my bank details and passwords. Anyway, onto the second module, the keypad. So this comes with a novelty that you can attach it on the right or the left side of the keyboard, which is pretty cool. It's definitely not the first keyboard that could do this. For example, I reviewed a Datadesk switchboard from the 90s ages ago that had that as well. These three modules here you could rearrange as you saw fit. However, here it is a bit easier to swap the modules around. Plus, you can use it semi-detached, which the switchboard couldn't really. I've used it at work for two or so weeks with a numpad mounted on the left. This has a few advantages, I imagine that a left numpad is probably better for left-handed people, there's more space for your mouse on the right, and you can use the numpad and the mouse at the same time, which is a lot faster in some applications. On the other hand, it's easier to get it covered up in documents and paper shite I've found. I keep hitting 7 trying to hit tab, my left hand isn't as practiced at my right hand as using the numpad, it's pretty bad for entering alt codes, and the numpad enter key isn't near my right thumb where I expect it, and that's also where I can make the most use out of it. But of course you can just switch it over and stick it on the right side instead, which is the beauty of this switchable design. The way you do this does leave a bit to be desired though. You basically switch the connector over to the desired side via this slide, which locks it into place, but then you've only got these two rods as stabilizing elements. This plaque thing at the bottom seems to be just a standoff, it doesn't lock into anything. And this connection feels really fragile. I mean, it doesn't hinge entirely just on the USB bus, but it's not far off. And you can see the keyboard sag noticeably when I hold it up like this. Plus, it comes off really easily. I really would have preferred something like the BFK system for doing this, which used bolted reinforcement plates at the bottom with brass bolt sockets. I mean, I understand that that would have come at the cost of switching speed, but how often do you switch this anyway? Plus, that way, at least it would have been solid, because on the BFK, that thing holds up very well indeed. I didn't have any worries there. Unique to this numpad are the four programmable keys with OLED screens in them, a bit reminiscent of the Optimus Popularis keyboard or of a Stream Deck. You can select from a bunch of pre-made icons or draw your own ones, like these lovely lock and backspace icons are made. I tried programming the numlock key into a tab key as well, by the way, but that didn't work. It still just outputs numlock. Anyway, I'm not sure how wise it is to keep the same image on OLED screens for so long. Short summary of the keycaps, the keycaps are laser ablated, thin ABS. They're pretty cheap, but at least they don't have a shitty cyber font. I think I've seen them before on some other boards actually, they're pretty basic. The backlighting is also pretty basic, and it's very badly bundled. If you look at the reflections on the keycaps, you can see that the light curdles terribly. It's one of the worst bundled backlights I've ever seen on a keyboard. I went for this blue-white snowy mode to go with the mountain theme, which is a preset on the keyboard but not in the software for some reason, so every time I open the software I have to reset this lighting mode on the keyboard itself. But if I switch it to white, yes, this is white by the way, you can see that it really looks like a rainbow and nothing like actual white. That's a pro tip I can give you by the way, if you want to see how good the light bundling on your keyboard is, switch it to white or yellow. If it's bad, it'll stick out like a sore thumb with those colours. Some other extras include pre-lubed stabilizers, you know, for those of you who care about that, and adjustable feet based on these magnetic discs. It's kind of a gimmick in my opinion, I've seen many types of feet that were more conveniently and more finely adjustable and which didn't have the risk of getting lost, like these. It just seems more flashy in practice than utilitarian. By default it comes with Cherry MX RGB switches, red ones in this case, but of course it's hot swappable so you can stick in it what you want. Except you can't because it's only compatible with three pin switches, not with ones that have fixing pins. That's something the original GMMK had as well and it's a really stupid oversight in my opinion. I mean, Jesus fucking Christ getting a Prince Albert guys, how could you possibly fuck that one up? The worst thing about the keyboard is the pricing though. It's 250 euros, or about 300 dollary doodles in yeehaw units, and I really don't see where it's going. I mean, that's almost $100 more than a Corsair K95, or over $100 more than a Razer Black Widow, and those are already massively overpriced. I mean, sure, you're getting a bit more with those detachable modules, but the quality of them isn't as high as I would have hoped, and they just don't work all that well. 
I mean, for that sort of money, you can get a proper decked out GMMK Pro, and that feels much more like a quality product than this does, so I must admit I'm a bit disappointed. I think their long development time hasn't helped either. I reckon that this keyboard would have been more relevant a year and a half ago. Don't get me wrong, it's not a bad keyboard. It's not like I'm typing on an Amstrad or anything here, but I think the execution is pretty disappointing considering the premium price that you pay for it. It is better looking than the GMMK Pro in my opinion. In fact, I'd say its looks are probably its best feature actually. But then if you slap the modules on, they make it a lot uglier. But then they're kind of the whole point of this keyboard. So I'm not really sure where this sits really, or <laughs> frankly, what the point of it is anymore. Anyway, that's it for this review. Thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed it. And following is a typing demonstration of me typing on this keyboard.